And so my research group at Imperial College has been going for about 10 years now. And we focus on synthetic biology and microbes. Uh, we are trying at the moment to start projects in uh, mammalian cells as well. Uh, but predominantly, we've done our work over the years in uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast, E. coli bacteria, uh, and then we've also have work in the group on a type of bacteria called Kerataecus, uh, which produces cellulose, and then some other bacteria as well, B. subtilis and Geobacillus, as well as Picia pastoris yeast. But today I'm mostly going to be talking to you about our work in synthetic biology in yeast, Baker's yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, we, that's the predominant uh, organism we use in my research group uh, and the reason we like to use it is because it's magic. It's uh, the magic ingredient um, and for many uh, hundreds if not thousands of years it was seen as this magic component in, uh, in fermentation particularly for alcohol production that somehow was gifted from the gods that led to uh, alcohol and risen bread. And we think it's magic still in terms of its abilities to act as an organism for synthetic biology. So if you've not worked with yeast before, I would encourage you to try and get a project somewhere or uh, which allows you to dabble with uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast because all the kind of things that might frustrate you with another organism you're working with are a lot easier in, uh, in yeast. So this is what uh, Baker's yeast looks like under the microscope and uh, our, our knowledge and our love of working with Baker's yeast comes from its uh, massive importance in the food industry, um, where it's obviously used for beer production, uh, bread production, and wine production. And I'm sure many of you in the last few months under lockdown have tried to get hold of some yeast or have even been brave enough to try and grow your own sourdough starters. Um, it's certainly the interest in yeast is rising right now uh, due to um, everyone kind of trying to make their own bread or just being bored and trying to come up with a new hobby. So there's a lot of use for yeast in the food industry. And since the 1980s as well, yeast has been an important source of medicine. Uh, Novo Nordisk um, uh, pioneered producing um, biologic, biologics um, from yeast uh, when they produced human insulin produced from Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast in the mid 1980s. Uh, and this quickly became the predominant supply of insulin for diabetics worldwide, overtaking the previously produced insulin that was made from um, cloning in E. coli. Because yeast is a better organism for mass production and a safer organism for producing things that then get injected into people because it doesn't have endotoxins like bacteria do. So yeast has been important uh, in the last few decades as a source of medicine. The other great thing about yeast is it's a, a really fantastic organism for biology research uh, because it is a eukaryote that is single celled, uh, work, grows with very uh, quick growth time for a eukaryote and with very minimal um, expensive uh, equipment required and can also go through a sexual life cycle in a very short period of time. It just really provides the ultimate uh, organism to be able to do biological studies at really high throughput scale. So you can see that there's lots of high throughput instruments on this slide, like automated machines that can do large scale mating experiments and, and machines that are looking to fermentation and obviously microscopy and tagging as well. So as all of these great things about yeast, uh, it, it basically set, set the scene 15 years ago when synthetic biology was starting to get going for yeast to become one of the predominant organisms for synthetic biology. Um, already there was a huge growth uh, in yeast biotechnology, particularly in the use of yeast to break down uh, waste components such as lignocellulosic biomass and convert those into metabolites that could be in, of use to people such as um, chemical precursors or biofuels. And that was perfect for yeast at the time because at the same time systems biology uh, in the in the early 2000s was coming of age and systems biology also had identified yeast as being one of the top organisms for its research because of all of the high throughput genetics and high throughput mating that could be done uh, with yeast cells. So the two things combined made it inevitable that yeast would be a great uh, chassis organism for synthetic biology. And really in the last 10 years, it's got better and better and better. Um, there is now a very extensive modular um, parts-based 
a synthetic biology toolkit based on Golden Gate Assembly uh, that came out of John Duber's lab at UC Berkeley called the Yeast Toolkit or the Yeast Moclo Toolkit, which really allows us to sort of compose DNA programs from uh, building block parts in a very quick and easy way and put those into yeast cells to be able to make um, hundreds if not thousands of different designs of DNA programs for use in synthetic biology in a very short period of time. And this is uh, the toolkit that my lab has moved to using in the last uh, six years. We really, um, like, uh, the phrase is we really cook on gas, you know, we're doing um, much more uh, faster work uh, since we switched to using this modular system. Synthetic biology and yeast has obviously advanced to the point where we even have teams, uh, including our team, as part of a project to make a synthetic version of the entire genome of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This is the SC 2.0 project, which has successfully produced uh, seven now um, of the 16 chromosomes of yeast in synthetic form. Um, that project is, is close to being completed. I'm not going to talk about it in too many details today in this talk, um, but our research group at Imperial over the last six years have been building and finalizing one of those chromosomes, chromosome 11, which is 680,000 base pairs in length. Uh, it took us about three years to construct it from the syn synthesized DNA that was designed with all of the changes in the yeast genome. And we've had another about three years of trying to fix all of the bugs that occurred by making those design changes and leading to the yeast cells not being as fit as normal. But we're pretty much at the end of this project and we're writing the paper right now, which we hope to submit this summer, although the final bug um, needs to be fixed and there's no lab that we can go to to fix it right now, which is slightly annoying. Just a quick final point about the Synthetic Yeast Genome Project, which is not going to be the focus of this talk. The coolest uh, modification we're making uh, with this uh, project is to place um, uh, recombination sites uh, throughout uh, the chromosome downstream of every non-essential gene. And those recombination sites uh, can then be um, the focus of recombination reactions when the Cre recombinase is present. Uh, and this means that in vitro, inside the nucleus of a living, growing synthetic yeast uh, cell from our project, we can induce the, uh, the chromosomes to shuffle their content uh, in a process we call scramble, where the different pieces of DNA encoding each gene can be swapped around into different positions and some can be deleted and others can be duplicated, which really means a very, very fast form of uh, genome evolution can happen on demand in the tube. Uh, and it allows us to kind of shuffle the cards in terms of uh, our, our genes that are available to, to run a task. So that's a very useful um, tool that we've started to exploit, which will come in uh, which, which I'll show you some use for in some of the later slides in this talk. But anyway, this talk today was focused on uh, how yeast can, uh, and the engineering of yeast through synthetic biology can help solve global challenges. And so we know that there's many different global challenges uh, um, out there. Uh, many of them are things that perhaps biotechnology can't solve, like gender, gender equality, uh, and financial questions, but then there are many ones that are related to biology and probably about half of them. And so we really think that yeast can and already is making a, a big um, push to solve these global challenges. So for example, in terms of energy and sustainability, we see the leading um, companies making biofuels from uh, waste products like lignocellulosic waste, like corn stover, which you see here, those companies, companies like Amaris, turn those into high value chemicals and biofuels, uh, and they do that entirely with engineered Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast, uh, the sort of yeast we are using in our lab projects, uh, but with many more changes focused on biofuel production. And then we can see as well that food supply and particularly meat supply is a major global challenge. And it's great to see that some of the leading companies that are making uh, plant-based meat products like the Impossible Burger have yeast as a key part of their, their production. So the Impossible Burger bleeds, uh, looks red and feels like real meat because it contains hemoglobin molecules that have been synthesized by engineered yeast cells and extracted and then added to the plant product to make it look like and taste like meat. Similarly, in new, more sustainable materials, 
uh, spider silk made by bulk threads is made by yeast uh, cells and purified out to make the materials and other companies working in the material space are also using yeast to make the, the components for, for new materials. So there's lots going on already, um, but as well as these sort of sustainability challenges, there are the global health challenges, uh, and that's going to be the focus of the rest of this talk. So I'm going to tell you about our, our work using yeast uh, in health-related projects and engineering synthetic uh, engineered um, yeast cells that can specialize in projects. And broadly, they fall into three areas. So we have projects related to metabolic disorders, which is uh, a big uh, component of the global health challenges. Uh, we have projects that looked at um, microbial resistance, and, uh, and that is, of course, is a well-known challenge. And recently, just towards the end of the talk, I'll be able to give you a highlight of how uh, some work in yeast by us and others is is hopefully going to help out dealing with the current viral pandemic. But the main focus for the talk uh, initially will be on these metabolic disorders, the, the first one. So the key metabolic disorder uh, that people will think about uh, and that affects a huge number of people worldwide that increases year on year is diabetes. And so this is a disorder uh, that can either be um, got spontaneously or inherited or can basically uh, be triggered by poor diet during your lifetime and some other factors as well. Now diabetes is obviously a disorder, a metabolic disorder because your metabolism becomes imbalanced, but it is basically also a, a disorder of, uh, of regulation. So your own set, your cells in your body are there trying to sense at precise levels the amount of glucose in your blood and then respond to, to the amount of glucose uh, present and in in response to the level the sensing of the level of glucose uh, in the blood to then either produce glucagon or insulin to then help your body then regulate back that glucose level to its appropriate level so it's a you know it's a homeostasis system involving feedback uh, and the sort of thing that synthetic biology should be good at engineering and so quite a few years ago now probably about six or seven years ago uh, we had a small project uh, which was a starter project in collaboration with AstraZeneca, where we wanted to uh, build yeast cells that would uh, sense at very high specificity glucose levels, and in response to that, secrete out pro-insulin or glucagon uh, from those cells. And that project didn't really pan out much. Uh, we, uh, in the end, we managed to, um, with, in collaboration with Twist Biosciences, managed to um, synthesized mutant variants of a glucose receptor for Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast that increased its sensitivity, pushed it to be able to sense glucose at lower concentrations than normal. And we try to then port that system over into mammalian cells to tie it up with uh, having it then being used to respond to produce uh, insulin or glucagon. Uh, but we kind of run out of funding on that and some of the um, work in mammalian cells was quite different. So we, we wrote up the first part of that as this paper in ACS Synthetic Biology in 2018, but then instead started to focus on other metabolites that could be sensed using the sensing systems in yeast. And so now for, the, for a large part of the talk, I'm gonna tell you about work done in collaboration with AstraZeneca and a group in Cambridge, a pharmacology expert group in Cambridge, especially, um, good for modeling of, of uh, pharmacological systems, sponsored by BDSRC, work used to reprogram yeast cells uh, for the ability to sense uh, human metabolites and other uh, interesting compounds. And I really just want to highlight here that this work was all uh, the, the ideas and the vast amount of effort and the talent of uh, a brilliant PhD student who's now still a postdoc in my group, William Shaw, uh, and his efforts uh, uh, were rewarded last year when this work was published in Cell, um, which is great that a single author during their PhD can end up with a with a fancy Cell paper after all of that. But he deserved it. He's a, a fantastic person. So yeast cells sense uh, glucose uh, using G protein coupled receptors, and so these are the largest family of cell surface receptors out there in nature. They're the predominant way a cell in our body and the cells in most uh, animals uh, sense the external environment. Uh, 
Um, they are found in almost all eukaryotes and they can sense things as small as a photon because they're used in light sensing and as something as large as an entire other cell uh, for contact sensing. It's really an, really an amazing feature of biology that this one type of receptor, which has a very conserved structure with seven transmembrane helices, can somehow have evolved to sense so many different things and be the predominant method for sensing. And our body, our genome has about eight or 900 different GPCRs sensing various things, many that we still don't know what they do. Those are called the orphan receptors. And if you go to organisms that are more uh, specialized in sensing using their sense of smell, like uh, dogs or rats, uh, you will see thousands of GPCRs in their genomes uh, because it's the predominant way we sense taste and we sense uh, smell. Yeast in, has the glucose uh, sensing through a GPCR, so it senses sugar, it's food, and then it has only one other uh, uh, GPCR, which is used for the other thing you care about uh, in life other than sugar and food, which is sex. And so GPCR is used in yeast for this pheromone response pathway, which is where one yeast cell will smell or chemically sense would probably be a more accurate word, the hormone produced from the other sex of yeast cell. And we'll use that system, that sensing to then trigger a, a growth towards the opposite sex and then a fusion to allow it to mate and become a diploid uh, cell. You can see from the diagram on the right there that that going on with the mating hormones uh, transferring from the two different mating types and then the schmooing which is this projection and then the fusion to make a haploid. And on the left you see the, the six cell signaling pathway, a very famous uh, um, cell signaling pathway that works through a kinase cascade where the G protein, which in this case is called ST2, is bound by the mating factor, which in this case is called the uh, A factor or alpha factor, uh, depending on the sex type. And that GPCR at the membrane then interacts with the G proteins. There's a G protein A and then a beta gamma subunits of the G proteins. And then that then activates a cascade of uh, downstream kinases eventually phosphorylating a transcription factor that then can go and activate uh, gene expression in the nucleus to change the cell's behavior. So this is called the G-protein signaling cascade or the, or the signaling pathway. Now, about 20 years ago, it was worked out that if you uh, delete the normal receptor uh, for the mating factor and you delete some other uh, components, such as the genes that are in that switch on to arrest the cell cycle and stop the cell growing, and the uh, and you delete or you change the promoter uh, used that's responded by the transcription factor, then you can basically take control over this signaling pathway and get it to activate genes instead in the growing cells. And so you would swap in another GPCR uh, of, for something that you're interested in sensing. Hopefully that would couple, like physically be able to bind with the gamma, the alpha gamma beta proteins of the G proteins in the signaling in yeast. And then that would cascade through and activate a specific uh, promoter that you could put a reporter gene downstream of, such as GFP. And so now in presence of whatever your GPCR is binding, if you're lucky, the system would then allow you to then get a GFP output. And in synthetic biology, this is this sort of hack from 20 years ago saw a renaissance in the last five or six years. Uh, and uh, a great example of that here from Pamela Peralta Yaha's group was taking a GPCR from an olfactory receptor uh, that could be that could basically smell decanol, a uh, biofuel molecule, uh, and they were able to uh, couple that through the pathway in the yeast cell to activate a synthetic transcription factor that then could produce GFP. And this allowed them to have a biosensor, a yeast cell that is now engineered uh, to sense how much decanol is being produced by other yeast that are biofuel producing yeast. And then if they're producing a lot, it would trigger GFP expression. So you could see, for example, if you were doing this as an experiment with lots of different strains, the ones that had, 
good decanol production would be starting to glow green because some of the cells within that uh, population are sensing that there's a large amount of this decanol being made. So Will wanted to be to, to build upon the kind of work done by Pamela's group here with plugging in GPCRs, but wanted to sense things from human metabolism using this system. And uh, it was it was shown from uh, Pamela's group's work that it would be wise if you wanted to do this to start to strip down the yeast cell to make it more more um, more easy to use as a biosensor so that you didn't get things such as cell cycle arrest uh, happening in response to the signal going through the pathway. And so we'll set about uh, refactoring the yeast cells uh, to make a more kind of streamlined minimal yeast cell in terms of its signaling pathway so that it would be better used for synthetic sensing. And so on the left, you see all of the components of the wild type pathway, uh, which include uh, uh, the glucose sensing, the productions of the factors, uh, and lots of other uh, enzymes and regulators that are involved in feedback me mechanisms and ultra sensitivity for this system. Uh, Will decided he would like to instead build a more minimal pathway that is easiest for us to model and understand by deleting out a lot of these components. This is the wish list of what he wanted to get rid of uh, or what he wanted to synthetically refactor so that it was now under the control of synthetic promoters. Uh, and uh, it's a very long list. And in the end, he decided to make a sort of a, a compromise version, which is the, the list you see on the right here, uh, going down on the side, uh, which showed that he needed for this sort of minimized pathway, he would keep about half of the genes as they normally are in the genome. He would delete another half of the genes out. In total, I think 13 genes needed to be deleted. And then a, a select few of these genes, which were real key genes in the system, uh, would then need to be refactored so that they were under the control of the synthetic promoter so that we can tune them, their expression level as we desire to make the sensing work. So he began this project with the undertaking of deleting out a lot of genes, uh, developed a CRISPR-based approach for that, uh, that allowed him to delete three genes at a time and nine genes in a cycle, so that in just a month, he was able to cleanly delete out the full coding region of the 13 genes uh, that he wanted to get rid of and have instead a, um, a CRISPR landing pad in place instead. And so that was a, a lot of work to delete all of these things from around the genome because uh, they're not all together. They're all spaced out in lots of different places. Um, but it paid off nicely. It gave, in fact, it gives us a yeast strain that was not sick in any way. In fact, it grew better than the normal yeast strain uh, because we'd removed having the burden of expressing these receptor proteins in the, in the membrane and plus other proteins from the system. Uh, of course, it's important to point out that yeast mating and the sensing of mating is a non-essential part of growing yeast in the lab. This is not, um, we can delete these things out, the cell will be behave just fine um, because uh, if you're giving it plenty of glucose and growing it in just normal culture conditions, then it doesn't need to do any mating. So this great work uh, initially set the, set the scene for Will. It gave him a base strain that could now be used for modular refactoring of GPCR sensing. So he could take his component parts that he wanted to work with, the GPCR, that's the sensor, the G alpha, the first protein it couples with that begins the signaling, the synthetic transcription factor, which then turns on specific genes, the promoter that is then uh, bound by the synthetic transcription factors, and then whatever output gene, so GFP is a reporter, for example, would be needed. And those five genes could now be built up using Golden Gate with all sorts of combinations of different promoters, different terminators, into constructs very quickly, dropped into this base strain, and then they would recreate uh, sensing signaling pathways through the GPCRs. And we could control how well that sensing worked by changing the expression strengths of these different components by changing the promoters or features of the promoters. The first time he did this, uh, just naively, with putting in constitutive promoters for each, each of these key positions, led to the cells now recovering the ability to sense the normal thing that they sense, which is the mating factor. But as you'll see from these curves here, 
what we got was the dark black line, which was this very poor sensing curve um, where you really had to get to quite a high concentration of the mating factor before it was sensed. And then you really didn't get much of an increase in sensing in response to the mating factor. And if you compare that to what normal yeast would have as it's sensing the gray bar, you would see much better looking curve with a much higher output and a much uh, higher sensitivity. And so this is a problem. Um, when you are trying to do sensing with yeast cells or with any cells or any form of biosensing, you really need to have a usable dose response curve so that if increasing concentrations of the things you're wanting to sense, normally on a log scale along the x-axis, you get increasing amount of output. And this curve, there's many different features to it. Key ones you want to look out for if you're trying to make a sensor is you want something with a big dynamic range so that the off state and the on state, uh, you know, responding to yes, I've seen the input is a big difference. So you see sort of very little GFP if you see nothing, if there's nothing in the system, and then a huge amount of GFP if you've got lots of your um, thing that you're trying to sense present. You would ideally like a quite a good operational range. Uh, so you would, some, you would want something that has very that is very sensitive. And then as the amount of the ligand that you're sensing increases, you get more and more output from your curve and you eventually get up to the high dynamic range at a much um, higher concentration. So you could effectively have like a linear relationship between how much you're sensing and how much, let's say, GFP you produce. But actually in some cases you might want it to not be linear. You might want a switch-like behavior. You might have a uh, something you want to sense where you really don't want to care, you don't care if there's uh, a nanomolar of it, but as soon as you get to 10 nanomolars of it, you want to identify all of them that are at 10 nanomo uh, that are surrounded by 10 nanomolar. So you need a switch like response, something a bit more digital. You see that in, on the bottom right little diagram. The other thing, of course, you really need is the ability to tune the sensitivity so that the, the point where it switches is that there's concentration that's relevant to the kind of projects you're doing, what you're trying to sense. And you really want a minimum amount of leakiness. So you don't really want a lot of GFP being produced when there's nothing present at all. That's the leakiness. So we had that problem on our previous slide and Will decided that could all be fixed by tuning the expression levels of the components. And we were given help by the group in, uh, in Cambridge uh, who produced a model of the cell signaling pathway, which we could then use to build up rules of how to change the dose response curve so that it could get to where we wanted to. And so when you do mathematical modeling, you normally say, well, I've got this component, this component, and this component. And I, let's see what happens if I double the amount of this component and half the amount of this component. And then you run the model and you see how it works. And that might tell you, okay, you're gonna get a better dose response curve if you increase this and you decrease this. Now taking that modeling and doing that in real life in biology is normally really hard because if you take a component and you try to increase its expression level, then you're fighting against whatever normally regulates it and you're de dealing with complexity because that component probably also gets involved in lots of other things uh, within the cell. But remember now, Will has stripped down the signaling pathway in these cells. He's deleted lots of the things that it, it reacts with that aren't important for sensing. And he's removed out all the normal regulated promoters involved in this and just put back constitutive promoters. So that means the engineering he can do in the cell is very much like what people would be doing in a modeling experiment where they say, I want to increase this component level. And so the, he will then just increase the strength of the promoter and he shouldn't really see any different effects because the promoters aren't regulated and those components are no longer having side reactions with other things in the cell, like things involved in cell cycle arrest. So this is a really great way for us to be able to mix modeling and synthetic biology at the same time by having a minimized system. So the first rule we learned from the modeling was increasing the concentration of the receptor gave increased sensitivity. And bingo, you do the experiment and it works perfectly. Higher strength constitutive promoters, higher sensitivity, matches the model really nicely. The next rule was that the next component down, the G protein, to get a really good output, 
but without having a leaky system, you needed to hit a sweet spot of its expression level compared to the expression level of the receptor. The model showed that, you know, as, as you get more and more concentration of the G protein, you get rid of the leakiness uh, and you get a higher and higher output, but then it would suddenly crash if you got too high. And the experimental data backed that up as well, so we were able to find that sweet spot. Now, the final thing about the curve that we could achieve by tuning was to change the dynamic range the, of the output, how much GFP you would see. Uh, and to do this, uh, we'll concentrate it on the synthetic transcription factors and the promoters that they uh, activated. And he engineered uh, synthetic promoters with lots of modules and combinations, which allowed us to, to have a library of promoters we could put into this that would express at higher and higher and higher output levels in response to the signaling going through. Eventually, he was able to even um, uh, break the records for the um, promoter strength in yeast uh, through some of these systems. So with these three rules from the mathematical modeling that then we were able to show in the lab as well, we we're able to build, re, we're able now to tune the refactored model, the refactored pathways, their dose response curves in a way that's very akin to optimizing a model. We would, for example, first uh, do the initial refactoring, then tune the G, the G alpha levels to remove any leak then tune the sensitivity by changing the receptor levels, and then tuning the dose response dynamic range uh, by changing the synthetic transcription factors and the promoters that they activated, eventually allowing us uh, to now be significantly better with less leakiness and a higher dynamic range than the natural system for sensing the mating factor in our yeast cells. And all of these principles, plus the strain, plus the modular cloning allowed this to be a very fast process. So you could optimize and use the model and think about what promoters you need to choose over about a three week period. And when that's all chosen, then you can drop in another GPCR into this system. And within one week, you've built an optimized sensor. And so to give you a demonstration, we did that uh, with uh, a sensor from another yeast. Uh, and in this one week, we were immediately able to get a really good dose response curve that actually perfectly matched the natural dose response curve that this other yeast has for its, uh, its own mating factor. But we've managed to move all this over into yeast in one go and be just as good in, in Baker's yeast. Um, he was then able to start putting in some of these mammalian GPCRs that were of interest to us. Uh, so ones that sense adenosine and ones that sense melatonin, which is a, a human hormone that uh, travels through the body as well. I'm able to get lovely dose response curves very quickly uh, through this um, um, rational tuning approach. So anytime he wants to drop in a uh, metabolite sensing uh, GPCR into these cells, we can tune the leakiness, we can tune the sensitivity and the signal amplitude to, to get the to get the kind of dose response that's relevant for the organ uh, for the thing that we're trying to sense in the yeast cell. There's one missing factor, uh, which is the hill slope or this uh, operational range, uh, which determines whether you have this kind of linear uh, relationship between how much metabolite you're sensing versus how much the yeast cells produce an output, or you want a much more digital-like response. Uh, where you want to set a threshold and say, if I'm above this threshold, I want every cell to respond, but below that, I don't want any response. So that's normally the hill slope, and that's actually a, quite a complex thing to try and engineer in the cell. Naturally, in the yeast cell, that hill slope will require feedback systems and degradation to be able to get the sensitivity. And if you remember, we build a system with no regulation in it, and so that becomes a problem for us. But we'll crack this problem in a couple of ways. Uh, both uh, his approaches to solving this required having uh, a consortia of two, at least two different types of yeast cells present in the tube to narrow the operational range to make something that's more digital switch-like behavior. <coughs> he would have one cell sense the metabolite and then immediately in response to sensing it, produce a lot of the mating factor protein which then the other cell would be set up to, sen to sense and respond. So the first cell acts like an amplifier 
and a, a protein called bar one which degrades the mating response peptide could be used to set the threshold. The model showed that this would increase the hill slope and when we tried this for melatonin it um, led to a, uh, a digitization of the response by 200 fold. Daddy. Sorry my, my daughter's just come. <laughs> Say hello I'm giving a talk to everyone. All right. Hello. <laughs> Go back with mommy. <laughs> Um, and so this would allow a narrowing of the of the operational range to make a more switch-like response, a really tight one that be between minus seven and minus six um, uh, molar, you would suddenly get a, a huge increase. Now to go the other way and to, to widen out something with a with a high hill slope, we also took a consortia approach, and here we see it typified with adenosine which had a quite a switch-like response that was natural for its GPCR. We would then design three yeasts that all respond to that, where we've changed the receptor concentrations in those three yeasts so that they have different sensitivities to the adenosine. We would then change the re reporter protein promoter for those three. So now they all matched up so that when fully activated, they produced equal amounts of uh, equivalent amounts of GFP. And then you can just mix those three strains and the population then is responds the amount of GFP you get out of the population of those three strains is the average of those three curves. And that then leads to a linearization uh, and a kind of decrease of the hill slope to allow now a much more linear relationship between how much adenosine is in the sample that you're detecting and how much GFP output the yeast produce. So to give you a good example of how this is useful in melatonin, uh, it's as good as detecting using mass spectrometry, which is the gold standard. So for a start, the GPCR is very, very specific. It only detects, only responds to melatonin and none of the precursor metabolites that are close in structure to melatonin that are, are used in its production, for example, serotonin. Um, we were able to take a library of yeast cells that had been engineered to make melatonin in different levels and secrete it and mix them with our cells and use our dose response curve and GFP output to measure the amount of melatonin each of these cells is producing. And it correlated beautifully with mass spectrometry data. And Will likes to argue that it was, it's actually better than mass spectrometry data because of the specificity, but also because we don't have to dilute our samples because the operational range in which we our cells detect the melatonin is the same range that the cells are making the melatonin. Whereas for the mass spectrometry, people, you have to dilute the sample or you have to concentrate it to get it into the, the range that the mass spectrometry will detect. And so why is this useful for um, uh, metabolic disorders in humans? Well, uh, the perfect answer was this was the moment we published this paper, actually it was before it was even published, it was after we'd pre-printed it, a sleep uh, research institute in uh, Spain asked for our strains because they needed a better mechanism for measuring the amount of melatonin in human blood samples for their sleep disorder therapy studies at theirs. They were using an ELISA system, an antibody-based system, which was not uh, performing very well for them. And the mass spectrometry system was uh, far too low throughput and far too high a cost. Uh, so we hope they're making progress with that. Um, melatonin is the hormone that is very important for human sleep and it's important to track for people who've had disruptive uh, sleep and are having therapies for that. So our paper was published about this time last year in Cell uh, and we've had lots of requests uh, for the strain and for the tools to use it uh, uh, and all of that is up on AdGene. In the paper we sense melatonin, adenosine and serotonin, human metabolites uh, of importance and of course glucose as well and not in that paper but work since then that we are due to submit for publication is for human uh, endocannabinoids present in our cells and also cannabinoids from uh, CBD related molecules from the cannabis industry uh, can be sensed by the yeast cells using this system as well. Okay so switching gears now to another global health challenge is antimicrobial resistance. And so obviously this is a very well known um, uh, problem in healthcare and in particularly in things like biological bioscience research and synthetic biology. I'm sure many of you, when you were thinking of what you would study at university, uh, were looking at 
the import the, the lack of antibiotics and antimicrobial resistance and, and super bacteria uh, but it's worth pointing out that although the caricatures as you see in this cartoon are very much about superbugs these bacteria that have uh, become resistant actually um, microbes include more than bacteria uh, antimicrobial resistance also takes in yeasts and fungi which are increasingly a very large part of the AMR problem. Uh, Candida auris outbreaks have been notable in many countries and are now becoming almost as big a challenge in uh, UK hospitals as um, drug resistant bacteria. There are lots of pathogenic yeasts and pathogenic fungi and so we need to be able to sense these and we need to be able to understand where they are in hospitals. So other research groups in synthetic biology, not my group, um, developed a few years ago, this is Virginia Cornish's group in New York, engineering yeast cells to work as dipstick biosensors for these fungal pathogens. And in their paper published in Science Advances led by Nili Ostroff, who's here, they made plug and play yeast cells that would sense uh, 10 different fungal pathogens, including a candida and this uh, a tropical uh, brain fungus, Paracocoides brasilianus, which is a, a problematic one. They would sense those cells via the mating factors, like the yeast cell has a mating factor, so do these fungal cells. Those mating factors would be sensed, and that would then trigger the expression of metabolic pathways that would produce lycopene, a red color. And so then they would put these yeast cells on a piece of paper and you would sit, you would dip it into a sample and wait a few hours. And if the sample turned red, it meant that the yeast cell had responded to the mating factor, triggered their mating, a mating response through the GPCR pathway, and then led to lycopene being produced. So we saw this uh, as we were uh, finishing up our cell paper. And Will realized he'd basically already done something like this in his project. He'd taken the mating factor sensing um, GPCR from a different yeast, from S. pombi yeast, and in one week had immediately made a really good sensor for S. pombi yeast because they produced this mating factor. Uh, but now this was in S. cerevisiae. And because of his abilities with his strain and his tools and the model, he could tune this. So he could tune this dose response curve to be more sensitive or to have a digital like response or a uh, or a linear like response and so we looked at that paper by Ostrov et al and we noticed that their paracocoides brasilianus um, sensor uh, although it worked and it produced lycopene so you'd get red from it it was really it wasn't very sensitive and it had a very linear relationship and so you can imagine if you go to a sample and you want to go, is this infected with this fungus? What would happen would be if there was a low level of this fungus present, of uh, the mating response from this fungus present in your sample, you would get a low amount of uh, lycopene red pigment being made. So you'd get a very faint bit of red pigment on your dipstick and you would probably say, is, is there some there or is not? It's not really ideal, right? You want something that's a yes, no answer. You don't want something where it's just a little bit pink and then maybe if there's more, it gets, it's more. In this kind of point of care system, you really want a, a strong yes or a, or a no. Similar like, you know, nobody uses a pregnancy test and, and wants to see whether they're a little bit pregnant or, or, or not, right? You, you're, you either are or you're not. So our system to tune was perfect for this. We could uh, put in the G protein receptor, use a uh, mixed population to digitize the response. And sure enough, uh, Will was able to pull the biosensor from that system down to picomolar sensitivity and something with a much more digital switch-like behavior for an on yes, no answer. So the other area in antimicrobial resistance where yeast is helping is in making antibiotics. I'm looking at the time now, so I better hurry up a little. This is work we published quite a few years ago, so I can go over it a little bit quicker because it's not necessarily new research. We were inspired by the fact that uh, at Imperial College uh, uh, at St. Mary's campus, Alexander Fleming had discovered uh, penicillin, although 
if you ever look into the story, the vast majority of the work that made it a real antibiotic was done at Oxford. So thank you everyone at Oxford, especially uh, Florian Chain. Um, so we thought, let's try and see if we can get real active antibiotics made from yeast. And so we set about with Ali Awan in my group, the challenge of the biosynthesis of an antibiotic from yeast. Uh, and we tackle penicillin because it's probably one of the best known, but also because it's a uh, exemplar of a candidate or, you know, set of, um, of antibiotics, which are the beta-lactams, which themselves are a, an exemplar set of non-ribosomal peptides, which are this huge complex uh, set of me secondary metabolites that do really important and interesting things in, in drugs and pharmacology. So it's a five gene pathway that to normally make penicillin from three amino acids, uh, one of which is a non-standard amino acid and some other components. And in the natural cell, uh, the last two, in the natural penicillin chrysogium cell, the last two uh, genes in the pathway are expressed in the peroxisome, a specialist compartment for um, low pH reactions. And the penicillin then leaves the cell. So we had to clone these five genes into S. cerevisiae the two of the, um, one of the two genes, the non-ribosomal peptide synthesis, synthase was massive, 12 KB, so as big as the largest gene in yeast, so that was quite a, a problem to clone. Uh, but it worked, we would, once we had these two genes in, we would start making the precursor, and then you add the three genes on a plasmid uh, for the rest of the pathway, and you start to produce very small amounts of penicillin from our cells. We then used our modular approach again to tune the expression of these enzymes in the pathway, particularly the last three in the pathway, putting tags on the last two to make sure they go to the peroxisome and changing the promoter strength, changing the terminator strengths and doing golden gate cloning to mix these all up. And this is the idea is by changing the enzyme levels, we can optimize the flow of metabolite through the pathway to get the most amount of penicillin produced from our cells. So very fast DNA assembly because we have Golden Gate cloning with a combinatorial toolkit allowed us to make a thousand different variants in one go using 10 promoters of different strength. And we would then select those that uh, were performing producing the most penicillin. And we would see a trend in that really, you really had to have the highest strength promoters for the final two genes and a medium strength promoter for the first of those uh, final three genes is the is the optimal design. Mass spectrometry showed us that actually as a great fluke, uh, um, very useful for us, the majority of the penicillin was not being made in the cytosol, but was going out into the supernatant. So something in our yeast cells was, was uh, e exporting this out. And so that's great. We had levels that were quite low initially, but through that optimization got higher. And we eventually got to a level where the yeast that was being secreted, uh, the penicillin being secreted by the yeast was at a concentration high enough that the growth media that the yeast were then in, the spent growth media, was now at an antibiotic level. And so we could put it on S, uh, pyogenes bacteria cells and show that their growth is uh, retarded completely uh, by our yeast cells. And this actually, uh, we believe, is the first ever demonstration of a bioactive antibiotic being made and secreted by yeast as they're growing. And of course, there's many, many different antibiotics, including antimicrobial peptides, uh, but this is penicillin. So it's a, it's a whole candidate system, which is great um, because you can imagine changing the enzymes involved to modify this structure to make other beta-lactam uh, antibiotics um, to help with the AMR crisis. Just a point here that if we put these yeast, this uh, same constructs into synthetic yeast strains, which have parts of the genome with this SC2 synthetic genome uh, arrangement, we can use this fast evolution system I mentioned at the beginning called scramble uh, to um, mutate the genome by this shuffling up of genes and deleting of genes. And very quickly, just in a few days, we can then isolate colonies that now have changed the genome to be better at our task. And we were able to double our penicillin yields using this synthetic genome approach. Similar work uh, using that approach is now being done and finished up by Glenn Gowers in my group, who was previously an undergrad uh, 
and, a, and an iGEM uh, leader at Oxford uh, with you guys um, before he joined my group. And he's been using this similar principles to make high amounts of betulinic acid, which is an antiretroviral drug uh, used uh, in development by GSK. And so the scramble system can produce lots of really interesting rearrangements and deletions of genes. And some of those mechanisms have led to uh, very quickly within a day or two having strains that now produce three times as much betulinic acid as normal. And that was our most recent publication came out a couple of months ago in Nature Communications. So just a few minutes left to tell you how yeast might help with viral pandemics, which is what we're all dealing with right now. And uh, I guess, you know, this would be if I go on Google to come up with a, an image to use for viral pandemics in my slide, this is the sort of scary thing that you see. But actually, I think for the majority of us, this is what we'll remember from viral pandemics, which is kind of lots of Zoom meetings and hearing about people making their sourdough starters. Um, yeast has interestingly been a, <laughs> a bit of a cultural meme during uh, this pandemic. The world is running out of yeast for literally no good reasons. It's very hard to buy yeast. And so lots of people are instead growing yeast, uh, leading some smart um, people like XK XKCD Comics to postulate that maybe the coronavirus is an, a yeast symbiont that has an extremely convoluted parasitic lifestyle that makes sure that lots of people end up growing yeast at home. So how is yeast helping in this pandemic? So a couple of things going on. Uh, reverse synthetic genetics, a group in Switzerland uh, took the sequence of uh, NCOV-19 back in January, ordered the bits of DNA to be synthesized for them and assembled that virus in yeast and got it expressed as an RNA copy in the yeast cells and then could use it for experiments without ever needing to get a sample from China. Uh, pretty scary stuff to be able to make a virus so easily, um, but quite useful uh, because they can, for example, they can start to, in the yeast cell, use CRISPR to make mutations in specific positions and then very quickly be able to <coughs> see how those mutations behave. That's called reverse synthetic genetics. And we've sent some strains and expertise to a, a virus research group over in your area in Oxford uh, for them to be able to also be able to do this kind of work in some of the studies that are going on in the labs in Oxford right now. A few groups are doing high throughput drug testing. They literally clone each of the enzyme, uh, each of the genes that is in the NCOV-19 genome into yeast and try and find a way that the yeast cells will only behave and grow normally if they are using that viral gene, uh, such as the, the RNA um, polymerase and things like that. And then they can then attack yeast because yeast can grow at high throughput with all sorts of different chemical libraries to see which chemicals uh, can then inhibit those uh, viral proteins. The final one, which is where we're involved, is vir viral-like particles, or VLPs, which are used in vaccines. And so there's, this is a whole class of vaccines which require just expression, normally from mammalian cells, but sometimes from yeast cells, uh, of proteins that form a scaffold shell of a virus. It's normally a viral capsid protein. And those proteins are normally then fused to a, an antigen from the virus you want to get immunity against. And, uh, and so this is done, uh, viral-like particle vaccines are out there. You, you may have had one in your life uh, as part of your vaccine schedule. Uh, and some of them are made in yeast. So at Imperial College, there is a famous uh, vaccine, probably the second best one uh, for COVID-19 that the UK has after the Oxford one, which is a DNA-based vaccine. But there's also a, th a third one, that not many, uh, another one that not many people know about, which is that Prof Zhao Nongji from the uh, uh, vaccine manufacturing hub has a VLP vaccine for COVID-19 working in mouse model SAR cells very nicely and it's produced by HEC293 cells. It produces this capsid, and then that capsid is, uh, it produces a capsid. You can see some VLPs assembled in a HEC cell here. Um, the, the capsid bit self-assembles, and he has, his group have fused the receptor binding domain of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein to the outer surface. And so if this starts to do well in clinical trials, it'll need to be scaled up to large levels to be able to go out as doses. 
but scaling up VLP production from hex cells is really bad, which is why lots of people in the industry who work on VLPs like to move things into yeast cells and do them at scale in yeast. So there's a factory in Vietnam and one in India that both produce VLP vaccines from yeasts uh, for other um, diseases. And so his group reached out to my group and Karen Polizzi's group for help trying to get uh, to uh, move over what they've achieved in HEC 293 mammalian cells into yeast cells. Yeast cells could allow many, many more millions of doses in a quicker time at a much cheaper cost. Rapidly rolled out. If you needed, you could theoretically repurpose breweries or yeast bio, biofuel production sites. Cerevisiae yeast is the, is the real one that everyone wants to do it in because it has no native toxins and the safety reforms, regulation for it uh, are a lot easier, those hurdles to get past than some of the other yeasts and other organisms as well. So our lab has been working on trying to help in S. cerevisiae yeast. Uh, his own group, Jowning's group, has someone working on Hansanula yeast and Karen Balitzi's group have been doing this with Picia pastoris yeast. Our aim is to express the spike RBD protein in a way that it gets secreted out of the yeast cells with a tag on it, an affinity tag that allows us to quickly capture it back and stick it on the virus-like particle, which will be made separately, uh, probably by E. coli and purified out. And then that gives us the vaccine straight away. That a system we're using comes from Oxford, uh, and this is in collaboration with Mark Howarth's lab at Oxford, uh, Synthetic Biology Group in, uh, in Oxford, and they produce this uh, virus, cap, uh, virus capsid in E. coli with the spy catcher um, uh, moiety fused to the outer surface. They have a startup company based on this, and so the aim is that from yeast cells will produce the RBD region of the spike protein uh, with spy tag fused to it, and then that can click onto the virus particle and you, there you go. Quickly and cheaply, you've built a vaccine. Unfortunately, our first response in the last month have been very, very poor in S. cerevisiae with, with no spike RBD secreted yet. So Will, uh, again, the guy who did the GPCR work is doing this in my group before he goes off to the US at the end of the year. Uh, he's trying some things to improve that. But I'm happy to say that Karen's group uh, with Picchia pastoris is seeing some slightly better results. So hopefully there's some hope here. So I'll wrap up now. It's been the hour. I just want to thank everyone uh, for helping me on do this work, particularly Will Shaw, who did all of that GPCR work and is now doing the vaccines work. Uh, ben Blount, uh, who's another one with the yellow uh, there and who's been doing the synthetic yeast genome project. And Glenn Gowers, who's been doing a lot of the uh, triterpenoid work. And Ali Arwan, who left my group a few years ago, uh, who's now doing nanopore sequencing of COVID genomes for the NHS. Uh, and he was the one who did the penicillin work. And I should definitely thank BBSRC and AstraZeneca in particular, who funded most of the research here. Okay, so two o'clock now. I hope some of you can stay for questions. I can probably stay for a little bit of time. Yeah, Tom, this was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. So. Uh, first, we've got a couple of questions in a chat, so I would just uh, read them out and then maybe... I've got a f Yeah, I can see them as well. Okay. So, yeah. So, I think the first one was, can the system add up different GPCRs, e.g. for short-chain fatty acids, and also do you believe the system would be robust with different output, for example, something to do with bioelectronics? Thank you for the talk. Uh, so... Um... You can put in a lot of different GPCRs into the system. Um, there are literally thousands and thousands in nature and probably 99% uh, won't work first time or won't work even after a lot of effort because they're, they're you know, they're, they require accessory factors. They require very different membranes than what yeast has. Uh, or they just won't tolerate the fact that yeast has a cell wall just above the membrane. So it's, it's a bit hit and miss. We have seen the decanol fatty acid uh, as an example. <coughs> that GPCR, you're right, it could be um, uh, through directed evolution mutated so that it recognizes something else. And lots of people are working on that. We've not done a directed evolution of GPCR's project yet. 
um, we probably will look into that because we've got such a good downstream selection system. In terms of interfacing it with something else, we've interfaced it so that the cells in a response, they produce something else. Bioelectronics is a tough one. Um, you know, not quite sure how we would do that, produce a redox factor or change the pH, but then if, once you start doing something as drastic as that, it then affects how the yeast cell performs as well. Okay, shall I read that? one of the other questions? Seems some, like someone wants to give the question from the audience. So, if someone to speak up, feel free to feel free to speak up. Perhaps let's just grab the next question from the chat. Yeah, from Teresa, I think. Okay. Yeah. Replacing the mating factor and tuning the cascade for sensing to stop have effects on mating and growth of the yeast. Yeah, it stops it mating. Great, we don't care about that. Um, <laughs> we just want yeast to do the sensing. In some later projects, which I didn't show, we do want to get the mating back, so it becomes a little bit more complex there. Does it alter the growth of yeast? Yes, the yeast actually grow better because they no longer have to uh, secrete mating factors and secrete proteases. There's a lot of things they put in a they they put in a part of their budget at all times to be poised for mating and if we don't care about that then we can have that budget back uh next question was from miroslav that wasn't a question <laughs> reza rahani can baker's yeast be used for live therapeutics yeah good question um it depends what you mean by a live therapeutic so there is a, a probiotic uh, yeast S. Bulliani, uh, which we could potentially move this system into, and that then can go into the gut, uh, and so that would be a live therapeutic that people could eat. Um, it's dubious of how much it stays and is active in the gut. Some candidas uh, are uh, inherent in our guts and stay there for much longer periods of time, so they, they would also be a good candidate for this as well. But you have to be careful there because they can occasionally switch to being pathogenic, so you'd have to engineer a version that you, you could have safety switches to prevent it being pathogenic. Um, Jefferson Smith says, expressing many different GPCRs uh, to fingerprint complex samples. Yeah, I've wanted, I've wanted, I wanted Will to try that, um, but he didn't want to. Uh, because there's only two GPCRs normally in the cell. Once you start getting multiples, you have to consider what's going to happen to the downstream signaling. Um, they currently have two very different signaling mechanisms, which allow us them to sense mating and glucose. If we were to add some other ones in, we would have to consider adding in whole new signaling cascades or somehow coming up with a way like mammalian cells do of having the signaling cascades converge but the flow of information somehow still being able to be deconvoluted at the end at the, at the expression and the promoter levels. I think that's a really exciting study that people could do is to try and build the kind of complex uh, interconnected cell signaling networks you see in human cells, but from first principles in yeast cells. But, um, you know, I need to write a grant and get the money if we're going to do that. Sorry, just an extension from that. I was thinking more have a single GPCR per cell, having, say, 96 cells in a plate, and then you could kind of fingerprint in that way. So it'd be the same system. You just use the different uh, sensor in the first place. Yeah, yeah good point. Um, there are some um, California-based startup companies basically doing that. Um, or Octant Bio, led by Shri Kazuri, is basically doing something along those lines. And I think there's another one called Eromix, and um, both of them have requested our strains because they were kind of trying to do stuff like that already. Um, yeah, it's it's a nice idea. We've thought of lots of things we would love to do with this, you know, since the molecules in beer, all sorts of things like that. But <laughs> there's only so much bandwidth a, a couple of people can do. How stable are yeast consortia in passaging? Um, so the, the ones where we've... Uh, set them to be sensitive at three different levels uh, and then we blend them together so it linearizes the response those are pretty stable in passaging we, we we checked after we did the engineering that both with and without the signal do their growth rates change significantly and they don't um, because the amount of gfp expression is not high enough to cause too much of a burden um, so thankfully that mix of the three is not 
uh, is quite stable over a period of time. Uh, next question I got here, Ross Kent, how stable are the scramble strains? Do you see sp spontaneous recombination in the absence of recombinase? Um, no, we don't. Uh, well, maybe, we're not sure. So <laughs> in finished chromosomes, uh, other groups in the SC2 system have um, shown that if there's no Cree recombinase in the cell, those chromosomes do not mutate do, by scramble at the lock sites for many, many hundreds of generations. Well, 100, 100 or 200 generations. That's been shown over many chromosomes. And we've never seen a, a rearrangement event occur in our yeast cells during scramble experiments in the controls where we don't have the Cree recombinase present. So we think it's very, very stable. But having said that, when we were constructing our, our chromosome, our synthetic chromosome, in one place in, during the construction, we ended up with the region being repeated a few times. And the beginning and end of those repeats was the lock sites that are recognized. So we think that they were destabilizing when the assembly was occurring, which is by homologous recombination. But once they're all in place, they're stable in the cell over large periods of time. Oh, question still coming in. Uh, in your opinion, this is from uh, Divjot Kaur. In your, in your opinion, how imperative is it to estimate the rate of resistance evolution at an early stage in microbial and to microbial development? Or do you think scramble and other methods will allow us to develop stronger antibiotics that will overcome antimicrobial resistance? Um, interesting question. I think for antimicrobial resistance, just increasing the amount of the antibiotic to overcome it is just a terrible strategy because you just end up in a arms race against this swarm of things that can evolve and and work in trillions at a time and evolve very quickly right it's you instead have to switch strategy so if you see antimicrobial resistance with one compound you need to start hitting with another compound and then another or a combination of compounds um, I wouldn't use scramble to make stronger antibiotics in terms of uh, the amount made or, or their effect. Uh, we would use scramble to get the production levels of antibiotics we've made uh, through other more rational changes like changing the enzymes involved in the chemistry or putting in different chemical pre precursors. So scramble is not really about generating new antibiotics but about making strains that are better at generating the new antibiotics we're trying to make. Okay, so from Ankit Roy, is there a way you could use GPCRs that do not interact with GPEA1? Yes, okay, so someone here knows their GPCRs, well done. Maybe you've had to study them uh, for exams. Uh, yeah, so GPEA1 um, only interacts with a very small subset of the GPCRs. Uh, interestingly, despite the whole complexity of the system, the majority of the interaction between a GPCR and the G protein is just down to the five last amino acids uh, and, and they define the interaction. So it's a well-established approach. It's called chimeric G protein where you swap out the, those final five amino acids for the five amino acids that are on the G protein that normally interacts with that GPCR and then you can start getting the coupling. And so that's the way, and I, I didn't mention it in this uh, in this presentation, but for a few of the GPCRs we've coupled in there, we've done a chimeric G protein where we've put in five amino acids at the end so that the, let's say the serotonin receptor can couple. Do you do any flux analysis of the engineered strains for penicillin production? Uh, no, we didn't do flux balance analysis. Uh, we just went combinatorial. We used Golden Gate to make a thousand. Uh, and then got the best performing ones and used nanopore sequencing to see what the arrangement was of which genes with which promoters, which gave the best. And then from there, did a second round where we then, then tried to further optimize by making tweaks to those promoters to either make them stronger or slightly weaker based on what we'd learned from the first round. Flux balance analysis might work, but it's, it's better for, I mean, we don't really know the, the enzymatic like KDs, the you know the enzymatic rates of these enzymes in yeast cells that would require a lot of biochemical characterization to get that. 
because they're they're not commonly used in in service CI these these enzymes. From Jack Chen, uh, exciting work using consortia uh, to engineer the Hill index. How would you compare this approach to more conventional protein engineering, changing a dimer to a tetramer? What are the merits and drawbacks? Um, the drawback is it required us to have this multicellular hack, uh, which means that you can't necessarily do, start using this as a single cell approach where you'd have one cell that in response to something, it, you know, you could have a cell, for example, that if it made more of something, it got a reward, but now you'd have to have multiple cells within it starts to all get much more complex. Uh, the merits, well, it's, it's much more rational and easy um, because it's uh, changing the promoter strengths and making another little genetic circuit, whereas the conventional, it's called a more conventional protein angle, like change a dimer into a tetramer, that's still, as far as I'm aware, that's still really hard research to do. Not many people are experts at rationally doing protein engineering to change them from being a dimer to a tetramer. But I guess there are ways, like maybe you put in a, a motif from another protein to, to get it to dimerize or tetramize. Uh, Ross Kent, have you looked to couple GPCR response to cell viability as a tool for extending fermentation productivity? Or reducing genetic drift. Very interesting question. Um, no, we've, we, uh, we haven't necessarily done that. That's been done a lot in the past. For example, some of the early GPCR-based sensors were, um, they use it so that the response triggers the expression, let's say, of the gene that allows growth in the absence of uracil, so the met metabolic enzyme that lets the cell produce its own uracil. And then you grow the, the cells in the absence of uracil and only the ones that are getting the signaling can then start producing and growing well. We've got things we've proposed in grants that will use this approach, but we're wary of it because um, as soon as you start to put a strong evolution, a selective pressure on it, then you're, you're starting to tip evolution in the balance of generating mutations to cheat the system. So for example, if you wanted to evolve the cell to get better and better at sensing something, and you're doing it through the selection pressure approach, then at the same time, you know, if it's, you're gonna end up with cells which mutate the transcription factor or the promoter, and then and they're getting the growth without ever sensing anything just because the mutations allow them to do that. So that's why predominantly we stuck to GFP and using flow cytometry to sort the winners because uh, we can have more control over that system. Uh, sorry, Tom. Thank you for a really great yeah. talk. I just wanted to expand on that a, a little bit. Um, I guess what I was talking about would be, could you uh, make survival of the cell dependent on the specific product that you're making? So if you start to get escape, then your cells die. So you can avoid that selection pressure I mean, there's always a chance that it will just stop making the thing, I guess, but it will knock out your yeah. So we've your, we your have, selective reporter. We looked at that for melatonin biosynthesis, right. right? Because there's these strains from Denmark that produce melatonin biosynthesis. Can you hear me? Okay, I've got yes, a, I can. Yep, yep, yeah, cool. We've got strains that produce melatonin biosynthesis and then we have strain then we have a way of sensing it so you can imagine a an automatic feedback system where you reward the cell for making more more meta, uh, more melatonin and so it would make more and more and you would just set the threshold so that gpcr has to get more you know is more and more sensitive before you get the threshold now here's the here's the big problem with that gpcrs sense outside the cell um, and actually if they sense things inside the cell it's problematic um, they start sensing when they before they get outside the cell when they're in the kind of the golgi body and if they activate within that they they oh, what is it they basically like they get they get locked up and the whole thing goes wrong and the cells uh the cells get stressed out so it's you 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 want to only sense something another cell is making. You don't want to sense something the cell is making itself. So we have thought and we've written proposals uh, that didn't get funded about a feedback system 
where one cell is making and the other one senses and then gives a reward to the one that's making like catalyzes the breakdown of the sugar that the other one needs um that has actually now been realized by a group at macquarie university uh in australia uh i'm not sure they've published it but i've seen their posters and it's it's really cool that they were able to do it so they have a two cell system where there's a well the majority of the cells are cells that make um that do the biosynthesis and then amongst those there's the sensor cells that then reward the reward the population that's making the most okay so uh looks like everyone's wrapping up but i won't forget eleanor's question are the terpenoid antibiotics tolerated at high concentration by yeast secreted or stored in an organelle cheers okay so those aren't an antibiotic the triterpenoid is an antiretroviral are they tolerated at high concentration by the yeast not really no they seem to to mess up and stick to the membrane are they secreted and stored in a particular organelle we think they're mostly stuck to the membrane i think on the inner surface of the cell membrane and we are we do think that there's a limit as to how much can be produced per cell uh before it really it becomes a toxic problem for the cell because you've got all of this stuff sticking on the inner surface of the membrane it's a real pain to work with that that molecule um, but it's needed because although it comes from birch bark which is basically a free resource there's not enough of it in all the birch bark of the world to provide the yield for the antiretrovirals that gsk want to make so they need a they need a method to make it Tom, um this was fantastic thank you so much for being so generous with your time and answering all the questions and we very much enjoyed that um yeah so for everyone, please, yeah, let's virtually thank Tom. Don't start clapping everyone on, on the mic. It'll be horrible positive feedback, but uh, yeah. And uh, thank you so much, Tom, for uh, joining us. And for everyone, please stay, stay tuned for the following talks and the following events of uh, Symbio Oxford. Um, just go to our website, it's in the chat, and subscribe to the newsletter then we send out info about what's going on in the world of synthetic biology about our events other events papers and other things that are cool so please stay in touch with us and thank you so much tom one more time Thank you very much, Tom. It was, yes, thank you. It was great. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. All the best. <laughs>